Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about uh, data from the web. So we're going to talk about how you can extract data from web services and how you can extract data from web pages. So as you probably recall, your mini project has uh, the requirements, I think 15 marks, something like that, for pulling data from a third-party website or a third-party web service. So this is going to tell you how to do this. And in the lab sessions, I'm going to have some practical hands-on experience of actually running the code, trying it out on different websites, and so on. So first, going to cover web services. So just to give you a little bit of introduction, so web service is essentially a page, uh, well, sorry, a, a location where you can access data in a nicely structured way. So, you know, some helpful person has made the, you know, if you type in, you know, uh, example.com slash currencies, you know, will send you back a list of currencies and exchange rates, for example. Or other web services will enable you to provide, to access uh, football results, the weather, you know, lots of people out there, you know, provide web services either for free, because they're nice, generous people, or you have to pay to access them and provide some kind of key and this kind of stuff. So web services are a way in which you can use HTTP to pull data in XML or JSON format, more likely JSON, and get some useful information back. And possibly you can send a specific kind of request to the web service and get a specific data you want back. So you might want the weather for London. So you send off a request with a query in which the query string has some, you know, the GPS or something like that, and will send back the data that you need um, for London. So the, the data is not in HTML format. That we're going to cover in the second half of this talk. In this case, the, JSON, the data will most likely be in JSON, but might be in XML format instead. Or it doesn't have to be formatted at all. It could just be unformatted data or a format you made up if you're doing it this, this yourself. So how do we access them? Well, we need an HTTP client. So we're working in Java. So, we need a, so Java needs to be able to send the HTTP requests like get, well, get, probably not post or delete or anything like that. So Java needs to access to be able to generate HTTP requests. We could, you know, do some dirty low-level socket programming and assemble all the bytes ourselves and get the format right and all the rest of it, but that'd be an awful lot of hassle. Um, so we could build one from scratch, but we're not going to because it's much easier to use a third-party library. And, there's, you know, there's nice people at Apache have uh, written an HTTP client that will do the job for us very easily. There's probably other third-party libraries out there, but you know, I personally, I've used the Apache one. It works well, so I'd recommend using that. So this Apache HTTP client allows you to send get requests or post requests uh, to web services. So it's great if you want to access a web service uh, using HTTP. You could use it for web pages. There's nothing stopping you using the Apache HTTP client to access a web service, um, pull the HTML, and process it yourself. But JSOOP, as I'm going to talk in the second half of this, uh, explain in the second half of this talk, is much better for web pages because what JSOOP has built into it an understanding of how HTML works, which enables you to select particular elements in a really easy way. Whereas the Apache one is pretty low level, just you get, you get what you get from that URL, and then you have to process it yourself. So we have to download it. Um, it doesn't come built into Java. So we download it from that link, or I've given you the jar files on the course website. So you, you can just download the course, the jar files from the course website. So, but if you're doing this yourself and don't want, don't use the ones that I've given you, then you download it from this link. To unpack them in a sensible place. I mean, I, I always have a, a lib folder um, containing all my third-party libraries, and then I can just dump them all in there and then add them as I require them. And then NetBeans, we right-click on the project and select properties and choose the libraries that we downloaded. So I think it's properties or add jar file. Maybe actually, I'm not sure that's right. You, I think you can add them in the properties, but I'll show you how you can do it more easily. So, um, oh yeah, so in properties, sorry. If you click prop, the properties of the project has like a library section, and you can add your libraries there. But you can also do it um, within the project itself um, by right-clicking on libraries here. So I'll, I'll just show you how to do that now. So, so here's NetBeans. Here's my web scraper demo. So, so it's a little bit obscured. Um, so you've got the source packages, which is main, and web scraper, which I'll go into in a second. And then we've got all the libraries here. So these are the libraries that I've added already. I'm not going to actually add any, but I'll show you how you do it. So you select libraries like that. Then you right-click on it, and you can add 
you have the option to add jar folder. And then you can go to the libraries, wherever they happen to be. So in my case, they're on D, uh, OneDrive. I see. So I told you I've got a code folder. In the code file, I've got lib. And this is where all my libraries are. So just select the libraries that I need. Click OK. In this case, I'm not going to do it. And then that you'll see that they're all added there. So these are all the libraries that Apache needs. So in fact, we're and then we need to import them in the web scraper itself. We don't need to explicitly import every one of these. We just need to import the ones we're using here. But these might have dependencies on the other ones. So for example, you know, to run the client, uh, you know, the HTTP get or whatever, maybe you also need the commons logging, for example. So this includes all the dependencies. So you need to import all of these libraries, which I'll give you in the jar folder. But you only need to import the ones that you're actively using in your code. OK, so that's how to import the libraries. So let's go back to the, to the presentation. So in theory, you can now run the Apache HTTP client. And there's various tutorials and the API as well if you want to have a look at the full functionality. So I'm going to give you a little very simple example um, how you can use a third-party web service to get the exchange rate um, for the Australian dollar. Um, Extract it using a, a, a JSON parser, and you know, then you, this would be the sort of thing that you could do in your mini project. So the first thing is this URL. So in your project proposal, I'm expecting you to give me a URL of the data sources that you want to use in your project. So in this case, this is a nice, friendly person who's built, who's provided a web service that lets me access um, the exchange rates uh, for different currencies. And this is the, the code that does that using the Apache client. So I'm going to, I've given you this code on the course website. So more than happy for you to take this code and adapt it you know, to, do, to access the third-party web service that you need. Not a problem at all. Um, so I won't penalize you for cutting and pasting this and then fiddling around with it to make it work for you. That's absolutely fine. I object to people copying entire projects. I, I don't object to people doing what programmers do all the time, which is copy snippets of code and assemble them into a functional project. That's absolutely OK. So, we create our client. That's the Apache HTTP client. Um, then we have a get method. We want to send a get request. So we execute that get request, and we get a response. And then we check the status code's OK, like it's actually found the appropriate page. And then the, end, the response has, we basically get the string out of the um, response. And then I've got a method that processes that response, and I've got another method that prints the response out, all of which is included in the example, in the, in the example code on the course website. So I don't know if I might, might go through this. So that's the full thing. So it's basically what I told you, but just wrapped up in try catch blocks. Now, the response is in JavaScript object notations. I said I'd say a bit more about that. And to, in order to process third-party data in JSON, you need to understand a little bit about it. So JavaScript object notation is a series of keys and values. So in this case, you've got a, have we got a simple example? No. So, and so, in, and this response from the exchange rate response is actually three objects. And each, each of these key value pairs is kind of like an object in which the value can be itself an object. So here we have base, which is the key, and your, um, which is the, um, that's the key, and your is the, is the value. So what this is telling us is that all of these rates are relative to the euro. Okay, so this is, so the Australian dollar in this case is 1.56 euros. And the date, the date on which this stuff was generated. And then you've got the actual rates. So that's the key and the date is the value. And here the key is rates. And then the value is this big object, which is in itself a set of key value pairs. So rates is then you know, you've got Australian dollar as the key. And then this double value is the, is the exchange rate for Australian dollars. And BGM, whatever that is, is the key and there's value. So all the different currencies are listed as key value pairs in this rates object. So yeah, rates is the second set of map in which the keys, the currency names, and the values of the exchange rate. So BGN is associated with the exchange rate of that. That's pretty clear. So if you wanted to uh, pass the result, pass this, if you wanted, to, if you pull this big, you know, fairly complicated JSON object from third-party data, you could store it in the cloud, and what you could do is pass that object. Uh, all the way to your server and then pass it directly as, as that entire structure. You could pass it 
verbatim straight to your web page and do the processing in your web page. That would be one way in which you could do this. If you pass it to the web page, JSON is like built you know, in conjunction with JavaScript, so it's very easy to process JSON within JavaScript. We just do, we just get a, we have to, first we have to convert this response string into a JavaScript object, which we do uh, here using json.pass, that'll convert it into this currency rate objects thing. And then we just access the rates, use the rates key, and the rates key has, uh, gets, gives us the rates object, which has a series of key values, and we want the AUD one. So to access the rates in this case, we just, you know, we create a variable point, and that is equals the value of this object with pointing to the key rates and pointing to the second key within that of AUD, and then you could do an alert like that. So two lines of JavaScript enable us to process that object extremely easy, easily, and this would be one way in which you could do it in your projects. However, you might want to process it in Java in your projects. Uh, you may need like a data structure. You might want to do the processing, the conversion within the servlet rather than on the web page itself. If you're more familiar with Java than JavaScript, this would be the easy way to do it. Now, you could, uh, have I got an example? You could do lots and lots of really fiddly string processing, right? You could, let me get this thing to work. You could uh, write some kind of fiendishly clever method that analyzed all the quotation marks and fished out this particular value from the, from the JSON object. You could do that, but I would strongly recommend that you didn't do that. Um, it'd be extremely fiddly, uh, it'd be a total nightmare, and you waste an enormous amount of time doing it. Um, so it's much easier if you want to process this JSON object to use a third party library to help you. And this is exactly what I do. And so what I recommend is JSON Simple. I only recommend it because I've tested it. There might be better ones or other ones out there. So you just download JSON Simple and install it in the same way as other libraries. And I've included JSON Simple in the, in the set of libraries um, that you can download from the course website. And JSON Simple, Simple makes it very easy to process this uh, JSON string uh, within Java. So we just create a new parser, and then we uh, pass the object to create this JSON object. And then we get the rates by calling get rates, and that gives us the, all of the rates. And then all we have to do is extract the, the Australian dollar object and get, its, and get the value of it. And there we have the Australian dollar rate. So, you know, your code may not be exactly the same as this, but it, it'd be similar. And there's probably tutorials on JSON Simple as well if you need to, need to look them up. So in this example, what we're doing first is we're getting the rates object, which is this, this thing, this thing in red. And then within that, we're getting the AUD, uh, getting the AUD object, which is get AUD, second stage. And then finally, we're getting that uh, double value, that's double number there, um, out of it. So in the code, um, the example code, which you can download from the course website, you know, you've got, you've got all this so you can adapt it you know, as you need to. So here we have, um, well, it's got a main method, which doesn't do much, except the main method just launches this class effectively. I don't even know if I've included that, probably not. And then we've got, like, run Apache soup scraper and run JSoup scraper. So the JSoup scraper, the code's there as an example, but in fact it won't work because the BBC football website's changed since I wrote the code, but it'll show you how you could pass the code in general. I'm going to go in that, in, into that in the second part of the talk. But in this case, we're running the Apache scraper, which is a method here that runs the Apache scraper. It does everything I told you that it did. It sort of, you know, executes the, gets the end, executes the get, get request, and it prints response and processes the response. Uh, print response just ex outputs, the, outputs the JSON as a string, and the JSON response does exactly what I said. So here's all the, all, all the bits of code that actually extract the Australian dollar currency rate from the rates. And if we run it, um, it actually works, which is nice. So the print response is just outputting the currencies as the JSON objects as a string. And then you can see it successfully extracted the Australian dollar rate, which today is 1.4567. So as I said, we're going to play around with this code in the lab sessions. So that'll help you get more familiar with it. Now, that was a little bit of a overview of how, how you'd process the response in JSON. As I said, I wouldn't expect you to just get it from these slides. You're going to get it by actually some hands-on practice in the labs. But you might also get the data in XML. And I'm going to cover it in, in this course because um, uh, it's less common these days, really. And if you need to do it, I can help you to do it in the labs. 
So XML, um, if you might need to pass data that's supplied, uh, that comes back to you in XML. Um, two ways in which you can do this. The way not to do this is to do string processing. So when I first started on this project on agent systems like years ago, I wrote code that processed the response XML, you know, using manual processing. It was a total nightmare, it took forever and it kept breaking. Much better to use a lib third party library to do the processing for you. Two ways of doing this, there's DOM parsing, which similar to the JSON parsing, it takes the XML document and puts it together into a, converts it into an object and then you can access the different parts of that object programmatically. Or SAX parsing, which is quite nice, it works its way through the document and each time it encounters a different type of element, it generates an event and you can have event handlers that process the different parts. Um, I quite like SAX parsing, but DOM parsing is you know, just as easy probably. Don't do string processing and ask me if you've got any problems and you need to process some data in uh, XML format and can't do it yourself, obviously. Now, this kind of um, third-party data processing, if we were running a commercial scale website like Google, you know, doing all that indexing and stuff, you'd have a super complicated architecture with lots of threads and servers and enormous distributed databases and et cetera. You know, it, it would all be done in a very clever, optimal way to make the best use of the CPU time. Um, in your mini projects, forget it. All, in your mini projects, all I'm expecting is to have one program that you press the green triangle and it downloads the third party data and saves it in the cloud. And then another program, like the serverless program we talked about in the previous lecture, that then pulls the data from the cloud and displays it in the web page. That's all I'm expecting um, for your mini projects. We're not, we're not going to download pentabyte, petabytes of data you know, for the mini projects, okay? It's, it's a mini project. Okay. So that was how to access data from web services. Now I'm gonna say something about how we access data from web pages. So web services are very nice, very beautiful. Someone provided this data elegantly structured into JSON just for your special use, okay? So many are free, some are paid for, but there's not that many of them out there because it takes you know, a fair amount of effort to produce a web service. It's much harder to put advertising into it and it's much harder to mess around getting people to subscribe to it. So there's not that many web useful web services. There are some, but not that many. Most of the data that you want is probably gonna be in an actual web page uh, on a website that's written in HTML. Now you could use the Apache HTTP client to extract the, to, put, to retrieve the HTML from a website and then do string processing on it, but it's gonna be horrendously messy and I would strongly recommend you don't do it. So just to show you how messy it is, um, I've got an example. So this is the HTML downloaded from uh, the BBC website like a while ago. And if you have a look at it, I don't know if I can zoom out. You know, it's, 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 it's nasty stuff, right? It's nasty stuff because it's, most of it's dynamically generated by different bits of code and databases and all the rest of it. And if you're trying to process this manually using strings, you know, you can see how huge it is. You know, it would be an absolutely nightmarish task and you just wouldn't want to do it, right? Trying to find your data, the data you want in the middle of this long, long string with all this kind of messy stuff, you know, just forget it. You're never going to manage it. Don't want to be pessimistic or anything. I'm sure you're all great programmers, but it would take a lot of time and be a complete waste of effort. So instead, um, we can use a third-party library, right? Someone, someone's written this JSOOP library, which we can use just for that purpose. So I've shown you that example Web page, what a mess, but the third party, JSOOP is a third party library that makes web parsing very easy. So you may have heard of beautiful soup if you've done any work on Python on the web. Um, and JSOOP is a similar thing. So you can just download it for free and add it to, you know, get the jar file, add it to your project. Again, I've included it in the set of jars relevant to web scraping um, and downloading data from web services. So we install JSOOP. And what JSOOP does is it downloads the web page for you and then it lets you access different parts of that web page depending on the class, the CSS class and the document and the, div, the ID given to the HTML element. So before we use JSOOP, we need to find the bit of the website that we want to access. And we need to find some unique properties about that that will let us pin down the specific bit of data that we need. And the best way to do this is using the developer tools in Chrome or Firefox. So I'll just show you briefly how to, how to launch them. So suppose we're doing a, a football website. That's your mini project and you want to show the upcoming uh, football events um, of the day. So upcoming fixtures, let's say. Let's say we want to pull that data from the BBC website. BBC hasn't been nice and kind and given us a nice web service that will let us access this data. Instead, we've got to get it from the BBC website itself. 
So we go, so we go to the web page. Here it is. So we want to programmatically access this data, and we need to find out which, which, what are the HTML elements that are holding that data. So what we can do is do the, we've got a, a menu here, the three lines at the top right-hand corner. Click on that, select more tools, uh, developer tools, and that brings up these developer tools on the right, which would be very useful for any kind of web development, debugging, Java, it's got a nice JavaScript console and the rest of it. You could also select get these tools by selecting control, shift, and I. Brings them up in the same way. Now let's try and find the bit of data we need. So let's see the upcoming fixtures, Hull versus Leicester. Let's say we want that bit of data. So what we do is we click on this element selecting bit here, and then we hover over the bit of the website we want. And as you can see, I hope you can see on the, uh, on the website, you hover and click. So we've hovered and clicked over here. I don't know how well you can see this here. And when we hover and click on here, that takes us to the exact bit of the HTML that I've, that I've hovered and clicked over. So I'll just do it again. So we click on here, and say we want the Everton versus Tottenham, or we want, say we want the whole table, let's say. Let's say Burnley versus Swansea. I don't know if you can see that yet. Hover and click, click on it, and then it'll take us to that exact bit of HTML. And we can expand on expand that if we want. We've got span class in a wrapper, and then we've got span class home team, and you know property performers and span class blah 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 blah. So what we do is we use these developer tools to find this little bit of HTML, and then we and then we try and figure out what's unique about it. In this case, probably the class home team um, is going to have the bit of information we need. So we could use JSoup to extract all the class all the HTML tags that are formatted with home team, and with a bit of luck, that would give us this list of uh, upcoming fixtures. It might not, but there might be a bit of experimentation that we might need to do in order to pin it down exactly. So first starting point, finding out the bit of the HTML and unique properties of the HTML that we want to pull out, probably a CSS class or a, uh, an ID. And then we can use this, the um, JSOUP to, to extract that bit of HTML for us. So, so I've done that, um, and I'm going to show you roughly then how we use JSOUP to do that. So this is an example pulled from an older version of the BBC website. So, so as I'll also tell you at the end, um, this process is fraught with problems because developers constantly change the formatting, the way in which the web page is structured. You know, maybe the B this is like a this example is maybe less than a year old, but already it's completely out of date. So, so this code for extracting the the upcoming fixtures from the BBC website, it's already out of date, and, and if I showed you another example, it'd be out of date in another couple of months. So we'll have a little bit more of a talk about that today, but when I set this example up, I used the tools I've just showed you to find, uh, I wanted to find the uh, upcoming matches, exactly what I said, so these are the matches. So today there's like a match of Swansea versus Stoke. So I selected that using the Chrome developer tools, and I found this bit of HTML. And what I found is that the, the HTML that I wanted um, was structured with accordion container live today. That's that whole, that's all this stuff. It's got the class accordion container live today. And within that, we have classes, uh, CSS formatting of home team and away team, which will let us get the, the two bits of data we want. So the tags holding the data are a combination of accordion container live today um, and then two classes, home team for the home team and away team for the away team. So it's kind of kind of nice and neat once we've used the Chrome tools to, to drill down to the bit we want. So the tag that holds the div tag that holds the data is called accordion container live today. And the crucial thing that might trip you up if you're not careful is that this is two separate CSS classes. It's not a single accordion container live today because the space here means that it's actually not a single class but two separate classes. So we've got to do two separate calls to JSOUP to drill down. First we extract all the accordion container classes, and then we extract all the element, all the tags that are formatted with live today out of, as a subclass of that. And because with CSS, you can apply multiple classes to a particular HTML tag. So watch out for the spaces when you're doing this kind of stuff. So we need to make two separate calls. First, we need to get all the tags that are styled with the class accordion container. And then we need to look within this collection for the tags that, that are styled live today. Once we've got those tags with accordion and container live today, 
We can then get the tags that are have the class home team and the class away team, and then we've got the data that we need. So here we go. So this is how we use JSUP. We have the document. We have JSUP connect. That basically pulls the page that we need. And then we, within, the, so that gives us this uh, doc. And within the doc, we can just use doc select. It's very, very easy. And this gives us all the, all the tags that have the styling div accordion container. There might be several. There might be accordion containers that hold like last week's fixtures or next Tuesday's fixtures, whatever. The live today ones are the ones we want. So first we get the accordion container. And then within that, we select the live today divs. So it's like the element div styled with the CSS class live today. So we've got the live elements. And then within those, we select the span tags that have the home team styling and the span tags that have the away team styling. And that will give us the home team and give us the away team. And job done. We've found all of the, all of the teams that are playing against each other, the home and the away team that are playing today from the BBC website. So the BBC hasn't made any effort whatsoever to give us that data, but we can get that data from the BBC website using JSOUP. And, you know, um, I guess, no, maybe not. I, I think the state, these, these meta engines like um, probably Money Supermarket, probably some of the estate agent uh, websites like uh, Zoopla, you know, some of these may use these sort of techniques to pull the data that they want and probably many other websites. Anything that's got meta information about other websites is probably using these kind of techniques, possibly in Python rather than Java. So this code works. Well, it used to work before they changed the website and it outputs home team and away team. So you'll have to adapt this code and that's what we're doing in one of the lab exercises. So as I said, websites change all the time. The structure of the site changes, the CSS classes changes. The developers you know, might say, well, let's update this site. Let's make it look a bit prettier. Let's have it according to container two instead of according to container. So it'll completely mess up your web scraping. So in your mini projects, if you're unlucky, this will happen. But you know, don't panic. I'll understand. I'll, I'll, you know, if, if in the demo it doesn't work for some reason and your code all looks good, then don't worry about it. I'm not going to you know, come down hard on you for someone else changing their website. So as I said, you probably have to wing it in your mini, pro in your mini projects. In the real world, you'd have, a, you'd, run some, you'd have unit testing that would test your code you know, every day, let's say, maybe even every hour. Make sure that they haven't changed the third-party website. And, and if it did, then it would throw a, you know, send you an email or something like that. And then you could go back and update your code to, to reflect the new changes. So I put the WebScape example code in the libraries on the course website. Um, you're more than welcome to download those and adapt them. And we'll have a lab session that will let you have some practice with, um, with the web scraping. So in this lecture, I've explained how you can use Java to download data from web services and websites. This is, the, um, this is what you're going to need to do in your mini project. Third party data, you know, there's 20 marks available, 15 for downloading this data from, from one or more websites, and five marks for actually storing that in the cloud as opposed to storing user data in the cloud. So next lecture, I'm going to explain how you can actually store that data in the cloud using Amazon's uh, S3 web service. Okay, well, thank you.